So I, I think we're now probably pretty good to go. So let's kick this off. So Carl, you want to kind of set the stage for what we're kind of talking about today? You bet. Well, welcome. Um, I'm Carl Bickmore, the CEO of SnapTech IT, and uh, my business partner, Sean, is here joining us, our COO. And uh, he's also our Chief Information Security Officer. And uh, uh, we have uh, locations uh, at, to, in the Atlanta market and also in the Phoenix market and also in the San Francisco Bay area. And uh, one of the main verticals we've had, in fact, the oldest customer that SnapTech has today is a law firm. And it's one that I actually personally supported back in <laughs> January of 2020 or 2000 is when I began. So we're, we're we're kicking on the 22nd year we've been supporting a law firm uh, as an IT company uh, per se. Now, uh, we didn't initially start with uh, uh, um, as many customers as we have today, but through the years we've grown, it's been a really nice sector and it's an area that we really enjoy working within. And we're, we're really hoping that we're able to share some good thoughts that might help a law firm sort out some of the things that you need to be concerned about or things that you can do uh, to help make sure that you're taking care of your data, making sure that you're monitoring any compliance needs, and also just you know helping to prevent or pro uh, protect your your client's information from from uh, reputation damage or just being improperly shared. And so uh, that's the idea we're looking to 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 talk about the strength in the data security and the compliance for legal firms. Fantastic. All right. Well, let's uh, let's kick this off. So um, one of the things that uh, we kind of stumbled across this piece of data that I thought was really interesting, uh, but one in five law firms are unsure that they've ever had a breach. I know for us, when we start working with new customers, we just assume breach at the very beginning, <laughs> just current state well, of, of you things. You only have to do it so many times before you come in there and you're like, hey, by the way, this is actually actively going on in your firm right now. Uh, so let's let's work to you know with your current IT provider or whoever's handling IT for you to get that uh, that those these things closed up or or settled that down. Uh, the, that's the reality of it is is we don't even sometimes know if uh, if there's something going on. You know we don't have it on the screen, but another stat that was part of that same kind of American Bar Association report basically said 36% of law firms have reported malware infections in their systems in the past. It's a pretty yeah. high number. Well, and it's uh, um, any time that happens, uh, you just don't know exactly who got access to what data. A real trend we've seen in the last year, as before they'll do the uh, ransomware event, uh, if the, if it's a ransomware attack, they'll actually exfiltrate or copy the data off of the law firm systems and into the, uh, an area that the hackers or the you know the the bad guys have, so they have a copy of your data. So they can they can take two bytes of the apple, one ransom your data and then get you to pay it back and then also come back for another swing to tell you that they'll release the data publicly unless you pay them again. Um, so that's been a, a newer tactic we've seen or just a way of ensuring that people will pay because sometimes they can restore from backup and they don't need to, but then they'll say, oh, but we have your data. Do you want to prevent us from, from, from putting this out publicly? Yeah, and so, um, Help us understand why law firms are such a, a rich target for these attackers. Well, I think it, it's not even specifically the law firms themselves so much as who are their clients. And that that is a trend we're seeing in general. This is true of clients that we have that are in the defense industrial base. This is true of uh, service organizations that have access to sensitive information. Uh, law firms oftentimes know who the real owners of things are, what the corporate structures are. They might know financial details around a customer or an entity. Uh, and some of the information they have is considered proprietary or secret that they may be protecting. And this is uh, this data is, is uh, considered valuable and it's considered helpful and worthy of ransom or worthy of being held hostage in some way. And so... Uh, it's not specifically that ha hackers uh, love to, you know, go after a law firm, but it's more about the data that the law firm has access to. Yeah, right. So law firms generate a tremendous amount of information, tons of documentation. A lot of times they have big operational things going on, you know, depending on what your law firm does, uh, like, for example, closing attorneys that have 
large amounts of you know cash that move around as well through uh, through wire transfers and, and different things like that. Those are all you know big targets for for an attacker. So how about the groups that we know of that are kind of targeting these firms? Well, uh, you know, it's very, very active in everybody's mind right now is the, you know, the Russian-Ukraine conflict. And that's actually historically for a long time been one of the major sources of state-sponsored organizations, China as well, as several organizations. They're not necessarily government arms, uh, you know, government employees, but they're definitely sponsored and, and allowed to operate and not prevented to. Uh, you know, in the various ways that, like, for instance, we would not behave here in the United States, uh, per se. And so state-sponsored organizations is a big upcoming, uh, it's it's increasing more than ever. They've been around for a long time. Uh, then there are the, the groups like uh, um, the hacktivist groups out there, uh, like some of the current ones we're seeing that are, you know, declaring, um, you know, uh, solidarity with Russia or with Ukraine or with China or or just whatever the issue they are, they just have an axe to grind, they just don't like America, or uh, they just uh, want to in some way damage or, or hurt our, our economy and our systems here. And that's the hacktivist groups that you find. Um, but you know, the, the real, the real uh, meat to all of this is that there's a lot of money in hacking these days. They went, when they figured out how to monetize it through these forms of extortion and ransomware, um, it became the the number one way that organized crime makes money. Uh, and so that's a very, very popular, very active uh, uh, group. And then occasionally there are just the, in, the independent hackers out there for whatever their, their motivation is. Usually it's they're after the money as well. Right, right. All right. So, so we, know, we know that they're after, you know, law firms and, and businesses in general, but, What's the biggest way that you're seeing or that we're seeing um, these attacks occur? Well, um, there's there's kind of like three to four major pathways, but the biggest ones that we see that will uh, snag a law firm in particular, because uh, they're very data centric, you know, you have your billing softwares, you have your timekeeping software uh, and you, your communication protocol, typically very email centric. And so um, the average law firm is a pretty rich target from an email phishing target attack uh, or even a texting, as they call smishing, like SMS texting, smishing, or fake voicemails, um, fake meeting invites to, to things that contain uh, bad things. But uh, so those kind of things are, are uh, very rich uh, from the attorney standpoint. Uh, the social engineering attack in general it is kind of an overcompassing uh, thing as well because you know usually when somebody's sending a phishing attack they're actually trying to attempt to do some form of social engineering which is to pose as somebody that they are not to pretend to be somebody to another attorney opposing counsel maybe a consultant maybe from the court systems maybe uh from a, a vendor that you work with from a, a software standpoint or uh, you know, uh, some type of uh, legal uh, uh, software tool that you're using. And so uh, the social engineering is really a key tactic that's used as well. Um, but the last thing is just exploiting known vulnerabilities. There have been some real big doozies in the last few years that have just been widely available and uh, and folks are just leaving themselves open by not doing the, the necessary configurations to reduce the vulnerability or the necessary patching to close those up. So you're seeing ransomware attacks is very, very common, uh, social engineering, and then uh, reaching people through fake phishing, swishing, vishing. A lot of times payments handled electronically and wire transfers, I'm sure everybody here can think to themselves about how they have had somebody approach them with a fake wire, wire transfer. It's just, nobody's immune to that. It's, it's everywhere. It's very ubiquitous. You know, it actually reminds me of a, um, uh, a a law firm client that we're now working with that came to us about a year and a half ago that um, got hit with ransomware. You know, what we discovered was it came through a phishing email. Uh, they tricked someone into downloading and installing a piece of software on their computer. Um, that of course, you know, gave them access into the environment. Unfortunately with this, with this um, law firm, they didn't quite have the proper firewall in place. They didn't have the right 
kind of setup and configuration of uh, logging in place. And, and logging is kind of a nerd term that you know, us tech people throw around. But essentially what, what logging is, is imagine um, everything that happens on a computer can be can be tracked. It creates these little log files, and it tracks, you know, for example, um, what websites I go to or what you know information kind of goes in and out. And so we're able to, if it's set up and configured right, we're able to kind of track all that. And so, unfortunately, this law firm was not set up that way. They didn't have the proper logging and the right firewall in place. So we couldn't tell from a forensic standpoint if any data had been exfiltrated. Out of that, out of that law firm, uh, the good news is, is they did have a good backup system in place, and so uh, we were able to help them restore their data and kind of get back up and operational. Uh, but we weren't able to kind of track whether or not um, any data had been exfiltrated out of that environment, which was which was unfortunate. So, yeah, but. I mean, I think the key thing is, and we'll get more into the, the you know the kind of things to know to talk to your IT team about. Um, to make sure is in place, uh, it, but I gotta say, you know, if effective logging that lets you know what happened. I typically only see that in the the, the legal firms that are you know 500 plus in size on the staff. Staff. I mean, it's just very rare. You you know, most law firms are are you know less than 100 people total, and um, very rare do we see any kind of effective logging in place that lets you know what happened, so you can kind of prove it did or didn't. And the, that could be a real nightmare if you have to disclose, like say an attack occurred because you kind of have to assume all data was uh, viewed if you can't specify or prove that it was only a limited amount uh, as no. an example. All right, so we talked a little bit about how, you know, legal firms are, are definitely a target. Talked a little bit about how they're attacking, um, attacking these firms. So now let's, uh, Let's talk about some of those kind of challenges. What you know, what are what are some of the struggles that uh, that firms are trying to you know protect against or overcome, or or some of the reasons why you know cybersecurity is a challenge in some of these firms. Yeah, well, there's some great spots on the slide here to think about. I mean, there's a, a big mix we see, and a lot of times it really just comes down to uh, you know uh, the uh, resources that are being applied to it. Um, uh, sometimes in a firm, uh, there isn't a specific IT person or security, cybersecurity person. Um, that's probably more common than not, that there is not. And so it ends up being an attorney that's making those decisions. And, and attorneys are busy people, and they got to get their billable hours in, and they got to do their engagements and, and uh, get to their meetings. And so uh, it does become a bit of an afterthought for them. And, and they, they uh, tend to focus more on just, does it work? not did I do it and make it work in a more secure fashion. And so the, the cybersecurity security kind of becomes a secondary thought uh, a lot of times. Uh, you know, but the, you know, the challenges are, are, are pretty clear. Like, you know, if you have a system down seven to eight billable hours due to intact, you know, that, that's a major hit to a firm. That level of productivity across the board is thousands and thousands of dollars. And if it affects a closing timing hitting at the wrong spot, you know, when there's an outage, it can really, really be costly. And so it's just one of those things that, uh, you know, cybersecurity has a potential for a big impact. Um, and uh, it's oftentimes not handled with somebody that's an expert in the cybersecurity. Uh, and so that you, you're, you do wise to make sure you have the right kind of consultation, just like I really don't want to get involved in writing my own legal agreements. I, I look to an attorney to help me with that. <laughs> I feel like uh, having somebody who is not just a good IT person, but also good at cybersecurity, because that's another issue is that sometimes people think, well, if you know IT, you must know how to do cybersecurity. And that's actually rarely the case. Uh, most of the time, that's not true. You know, that reminds me uh, just real quick about the just kind of attorney discretion there. And, and you know, just because you know IT, you don't necessarily know um, security. I've seen it in the past. And then I was also talking to a firm uh, a couple of weeks ago and um, their main way of scanning documents was they would scan it from their copier to their email. And while yeah. that works from an IT standpoint, that solves an issue, but it, it also opens up a large um, cybersecurity kind of vulnerability because a lot of times that document that's being scanned has got some pretty, you know, 
PII or sensitive information in it, um, depending on the type of firm you are. Um, but there could be some real, <laughs> there could be some real sensitive information scanned through email that's not really secure. Well, yeah, that's a really good point. And so that, that really points to the digital transformation is a lot of law firms are now moving to cloud-based solutions and cloud-based tools. Right. And now documents are becoming electronic and, uh, and are become, well, are becoming, I would say probably most have made that journey by now. That digital transformation is either mostly done or done. And so, there, yeah, the scanning process, and it's hard to think about. Like you scan it to a folder, you scan it to an email, it might be in more places than you think, and that gives you more potential footprint to where the data can be found. And so just you know, bear in mind, like if you have documents in your email uh, and you haven't done anything beyond just set up standard email, if your email becomes compromised, all documents in your email become compromised. You know, that's just a, that's a critical thing, connection to put together. Because so often we think about in our case management software, the document sitting there, or it's in our file share on the, the end drive or, or whatever, but it might also exist in your email, uh, and that can be a risk point as well, data of data loss or or data um, uh, uh, being being viewed by people that doesn't, that we don't want them to, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Good, good information there. All right. So now let's uh, let's do some tips. Let's help some people and uh, jump in. Talk to me about you know six tips that you could go do right now. To help improve your security. Okay, well, um, so I would hope that they've all got this going by now, but I, I, I still feel like there's a lot of folks that don't, and that's um, look, you can you can reduce your risk by the most common attacks somewhere between 80 and 85 percent if you just implement multi-factor authentication, and what that means is that means you log in with your username and then you have your password, but you also have some other way of validating you are who you are, that hence the multi-factor or MFA as it's called. And the two common places that it's really essential that you implement uh, multi-factor authentication are to your email and if you do any kind of remote access. Cloud-based services, all these things where you can log in, if it's only username and password, you are now leaving yourselves open to your password being hacked and that being an easy way in. Uh, and frankly, the tools and software available to uh, guess passwords and to um, work through those is astoundingly better than it used to be. And so even an eight or nine character password that's complex can still be broken in a relatively short period of time. You really need to get to much longer passwords if you wanna make that harder, but even still, uh, simply cruising past a password, like for instance, we we saw a, a firm get attacked, and they got the IT guy's um, uh, desk and uh, machine when they found their way in, and he had saved all of his passwords in his web browser, which are actually really easy to get to, because uh, he wasn't using a proper password vault to store, because that's really the way to go. And so now that they had access to all this information before they implemented the ransomware attack, they were able to go and find all the backup software that they had in the cloud and delete them all. And so they could, you know, because all those services only required a username and password and they got access to that mm -hmm. password, there was nothing else to stop them from getting it. So there's a big risk reduction if you implement multi-factor authentication. So what does that typically mean? It means that when you log in, you put in your username, your password, and then you're going to get uh, some app on your phone that's going to give you a one-time code that you type in or it's going to come up and say do you approve and you hit a button yes that's the most ideal way is with some type of app it's the most secure way there is a lot of them that implement by sending you a text with a code to type in um, and that is better than not having multi-factor authentication but the app-based method is the most secure because texts can be faked or read like email as well and so it's better to do it with an app, but either way, just implementing multi-factor authentication is the one, one of the number one things. Uh, the second one on the list here is the ongoing cybersecurity training. I think that sometimes when we're talking to law firms, they say, hey, we're all professional here, we're highly educated, and there, there becomes an assumption that everybody knows about IT. But uh, it, it, anybody who's uh, been in a law firm long enough to know that there are several people who are not as great with technology as they are great at being a lawyer. And because of that, um, there tends to be some pretty simple mistakes that can be made that can cause a world of hurt on the cybersecurity side. 
And so don't overlook the value of cybersecurity training. But what you don't know is that, or what you may not know, is that there are great programs out there where you can sign up your people and it will take them through a training process. And you as a firm administrator or a principal can get a list and see who's taken their cybersecurity training. And these are not crazy long courses. It's not like you're going to, to learn, you know, some, some major new uh, legal standard that's come out. It is really, you know, two to eight minutes of like, hey, look out for emails that say this or look like this, or hey, if somebody calls you and asks you this question, be suspicious. That ongoing regular training, it's not a one and done thing, just regularly putting in people's mind to be suspicious yeah. is very, very effective. Um, the other yeah, thing I is- kind of talk about that is, is yeah. trying to build a culture of security. So it's not yeah. a one-time training thing. It's, it's really, how do we develop this kind of culture of security? Because we've all heard, you know, we've all heard the stories and I've got a bunch of them too, of uh, people that got tri tricked and, um, you know, wired $43,000 to, uh, to, to an attacker that, and that, you know, that money is now gone. So. Right. Or even just the simple all. thing of faking um, employees requesting to change their direct deposit accounts that we see that one all the time as well. Uh, but the, uh, yeah, so that's that's the key is the ongoing training. And, and like I said, it's now relatively inexpensive and with a little bit of setup, um, you can actually make that happen in a more meaningful way. I find the bigger challenge to implementing is for everybody going, yeah, okay, I think we should do this. This makes sense. Because, you know, the problem is, is the attackers only have to be right once and you have to be right all the time with everybody in your firm, right? And so it, there usually are some weak spots here and there and it never hurts to be up to date and it's not all that time consuming. It just requires a little bit of attention and a desire for everybody to actually do it. Uh, and you know, look, I, I understand the personalities. There's many of attorney I, I, I've talked to that'd be like, why am I doing this? Or, you know, is this really worth my time kind of situation? I said, well, you know, it's, it's about risk reduction, reduction. If you want to reduce your risk, everybody should get this kind of training, right? Um, the other, other tips here is like, uh, look, a lot of people don't understand and realize that, like, for instance, when you're sending an email or when you're sending somebody a link to uh, uh, a OneDrive file or a Dropbox or Ignite or a share file from Citrix or whatever way that you're sending files is that a lot of times the actual sending of it may or may not be encrypted, but the file itself is not encrypted. And so when it gets to the destination, it's wildly available to anybody who gets access to that machine or system or anybody who gets access to the email, you can in fact implement an encryption add-on to services like G Suite or Office 365. And we, we have a real preference from a security standpoint for Office 365, but both are valid and can be configured in a secure way. You can set up email encryption, for instance, so that people can't, even if they get access to your email, still can't look at that data file, they still can't get access to it because it's encrypted in addition and it's just a, a service that you turn on with that, that email provider, or there can even be add-on tools that you purchase. Uh, there's a, a few ways to do it. The other things is like encrypting your backup data, not just when it's being sent to the cloud somewhere, or some, but also when it's sitting at rest on the machine. And most systems by default are not encrypted, and some backup solutions don't even allow the option to encrypt it uh, for it to function. And uh, so it's about picking the right backup solution um, for instance, when you want to encrypt your, your backup data, but encrypting your, your laptop hard drive, encrypting your backup data, encrypting email, encrypting uh, files as you send them through file sharing services. Those are critical things where you can say, even though somebody may have got access to our system, we know they didn't get access to that data because that data is encrypted and they'd have to be able to decrypt it. And most encryption tools out there, once encrypted, it would take years and years and years for the most powerful computers to decrypt them the way that encryption is done. Um, the other couple of things here are, are really so, about how so you- Hang on one second. Uh, just, right, just go ahead, Sean. You know how I like my stories, and unfortunately, yeah. you know, I don't mind poking fun at myself either, but the other encryption that, you know, that I, I think it's important to talk about is just encrypting your laptop. So many yeah. people now are working from home, working remote, um, and so there's ways to just encrypt the entire hard drive on your laptop. A lot of people, you know, may not think about or, or realize that, you know, if your laptop gets stolen, it's a pretty easy thing to pull the hard drive out of it, stick it into a little device, and I can read everything off of that 
you know, hard drive that I want to. Okay. All well, right. so you can keep a really going. great point. That, that's exactly it right there. Just where can you encrypt? Do it. It's not expensive anymore. But it just requires yeah. a little attention and detail to taking those extra steps. Um, the, uh, the the other thing is role based authorization. You know, this is a that's a very techy term for what we're about to talk about. It's just basically if you, for instance, don't need to be an administrator and install software on your computer, where most people do not, don't log in with administrative authority, as an example. Just log in as a regular user, uh, which is uh, to say that set it up so that you know only certain people have administrative control of computers or servers or firewalls or other things that you might have data so that you're limiting the amount of accounts so that if they get compromised can actually do anything uh, that would be damaging. So think about role-based separation. It's a really difficult question to give uh, in, in a uh, high level generic point of view. It's usually pretty specific to any firm that we're working with on how you go about that. But generally there should be only a, one or two people that should be able to administer things. And then the rest can just be users of that product or tool or system, if that makes sense. I'll tell you another one that I see a good bit is in the file directory structure mm -hmm. where just kind of everybody has access to everything, uh, which is not the most ideal solution from a security standpoint, but from a, from a, you know, just an IT practical get it to work kind of thing. That's what has happened in the past. Uh, but that does open you up to, you know, some risks there. Right, because if somebody gets their computer hacked and they happen to have access to every client file or every other data that's out there, all that data can be reached by them. Therefore, the attack can right. operate as them and can affect any data they have access to change, right? Correct. So that's the, that's the risk is if you reduce it to just what they need uh, versus everything, then you're greatly reducing the risk footprint there. Uh, uh, the next one is about ensuring secure passwords from the top down. Uh, I know everybody loves passwords uh, and they wish they had a few more in their life. Uh, <laughs> uh, it, uh, the key thing is, is uh, probably more than anything is think of uh, past phrases instead of passwords, because the number one thing you can do to make a password better is make it longer. Um, you know, we're talking 14, 20 characters long. And so I don't know how many 14 letter words, you know, Sean. I don't know that many. I'd have to really sit there and think about it. But I do know some great phrases that put together three or four words that turn out to be easily remembered and also um, are lengthy. Uh, and so the, the, the current systems out there and how they can hack are uh, less affected by um, the complexity of the password, more affected by the length of the password that you use. So start using longer passwords. And frankly, when it says enforcing them, this means that you should not allow certain people to be exceptions. And I can tell you, you know, principals at firms are notorious for this, for saying, oh, everybody else can do that longer password, but let me use the one I've been using for the last 10 years. That's only, you know, my initials, or I've seen a lot of stuff like that in firms as we've gone. It's really time to take a different approach. Authentication is the number one gateway into your world, the number one gateway for a hacker or a, pro a bad program to get started. And so you just simply oh. have to take different approach. So you're telling me I should use some passphrases, you know, kind of like something similar to the Georgia Bulldogs are national champs. Oh, that would be a yeah. good passphrase. That, that, I believe that's above 14 characters. Huh. I, I, I can't imagine why you would think that. You know what, Sean, it might you might want to not pick one so easily guessed or overused, <laughs> you know. Which by the way, that's not my password, but I'm just giving you an example of what would be a good passphrase to use. <laughs> yeah. Well, and the, so the, the the last thing to talk about here after the passwords, and this is a new thing and something that I would think a lot of folks on the webinar may have not even had introduced to them. It, it is something that's been in use in very large enterprises, particularly financial institutions and banks for a while. And it's now become really available to the average small business in a price point that you can work with. But this is uh, a, a software tool that does what's called application control. By default, the disposition of all computer systems is to run any file or any executable or any script or any add-in that it's been told to. 
the computer just obeys the command to say, install the software, do this thing. And so, so much of what we spend all our time doing is trying to say, let everything run, but let's put this antivirus software here to block the bad stuff. So look at it, let it run, but before you do, check to make sure it's a bad guy or not. If it's a bad guy, stop it. The problem is, is very little can be done to stop a lot of attacks today if somebody gets access to your system. Because of that, you you really want to look at the zero trust architecture and to use things like application control, which changes your computer to that nothing runs except what's been expressly permitted. So instead of everything running except what's been expressly denied, it's the reverse, only can run what's permitted. And uh, that does take a little bit of management. And I, I don't know a lot of attorneys that would have the IT skills to set up this software, but talk to your IT resource about this and talk to your IT provider, whoever that is, about implementing application control because this is a really effective pro uh, protection tool. It's a new tool, it's a new method, and I highly recommend folks really investigate it because uh, it really flips the default mode on its head and makes it a lot more likely that you're gonna stop an attack that your antivirus wouldn't have, as an example. Yes, and so since it's kind of a new concept, we kind of threw this slide together just to kind of help people kind of visually understand how all that kind of works. But essentially, it's installing a piece of software, you know, on an endpoint or a computer, if you will, turning it on this this learning mode, this kind of step two that kind of catalogs every piece of software and plug-in that's kind of running in the environment, and then you explicitly approve the software, just like you were describing prove the software and plugins in the environment, then we turn it into a lockdown mode, and then that prevents anything that's not approved from running. So, uh, right. and then you just manage and approve things as, uh, as, as new software needs to be added. Um, it's a pretty simple process, and it, prompt the end, it prompts the end user and says, hey, uh, request access to the software, and they can request access. Uh, and get approved yeah, I mean, by their IT provider. Yeah, it's clever because it will even, every time an update is changed or if, it's not just like you say, hey, let me run Adobe Acrobat. Um, it's like which version with what add-ons and everything is uh, expressly approved. And so you, if you get a, a new update to that and the policy is good and it's the correct actual file, it would be great. But if somebody, for instance, created a fake update uh, to get it to try to install on your system that included some bad software, it won't check out correctly and the application control will prevent it from running. So the attack never gets started. And that's the real key to this whole thing is it's gonna be able to stop things that haven't been thought of or seen before simply because it's not the known exact file with exactly the right security hash that tells us it's exactly the original file, um, it, then it won't operate. Or if it's a, a new script or a new thing that, that a hacker's trying to run to, to encrypt your data or to do things, those programs can't run because they're not expressly approved. Yeah, excellent. All right, I know we're running a little bit late, so how are we gonna talk about just kind of a holistic approach to cybersecurity? So yeah, we'll, look, we'll hit some questions and then we'll wrap this puppy up. Okay, well, uh, and I think, thanks everybody for hanging with us. We appreciate you having you here. Hopefully you're finding some value in this content and, and uh, we'll be here for questions. Uh, you, know, you can reach out to us even afterwards if you need anything. But uh, I, I think a lot of times um, when people are thinking about IT, they think about um, the protection side, get your antivirus, get your backup, do some permission things. Um, what they don't realize is a comprehensive approach really is much more than just the protection. You need to be able to identify all computer systems, all phones, all devices, or thermostat, whatever's in your IT space that runs off your network, you need to be able to identify them. You do need to be able to protect them in all the ways that we protect them. But you also need things like logging control that can detect things that are going on and allow you to look back. And, and uh, But also, realistically, today what we talk about isn't if you're gonna get attacked, but you should kind of think mentally when and how resilient can you be to that attack. And so having good response plan to an incident, an incident response plan that knows how to handle an IT hack, uh, for instance, and then plan for a quick recovery method so that you, if something bad happens and you do need to go to the backup and restore things or, or there is an interruption that you're minimizing it as much as possible. 
And so there's ongoing IT management, but really you should have programs functioning in identifying everything on your network, protecting your network, detecting things that are happening in your network that might've got past your protection, plan for how to respond to things and a plan for how to recover quickly and as effectively as possible. If you don't have all of those sections functioning in your firm, you you uh, could could regret it in the future, for instance, and or it just be wise way a wise way to reduce the risk of your business to think more comprehensively than I'm just going to throw up a bunch of protection. I mean, we just talked about application control, and that's awesome protection, but you would still need detection, respond, recover. You need regular ongoing management, and you need to be able to identify that. If you don't have all those components, you're missing something that leaves you with a greater risk that uh, that you may not be aware of. Excellent. Well said. All right. So we got time for a couple of questions. So if you've got questions, there's a way to add, you know, ask those right through the uh, right through the the webinar software right there. You can type those in. We'll we'll be monitoring and looking for a couple of those. Um, uh, so here's one for you, Carl. Most important. Uh, from a priority standpoint, security assessment, penetration testing, employee training. Yeah, so it's the priority where you started question, I guess, or yeah. where do you go? Um, I think when it comes to cybersecurity, it can be overwhelming, and sometimes you think you have to do it all at once. I think it's a far better practice to just begin a regular process of identifying and continually improving you probably can't do it all at once. And so from my perspective, I think getting a security assessment at the beginning to actually know and comprehensively understand where your risks are or not, where you're strong in protection, where you're strong in detection or where you're maybe weak in those things uh, to get your list and then create a plan from an assessment is better than just starting off with uh, uh, these other things. But the reality of it is, is you know, employee training's great. Um, but I would start with the security assessment that's more comprehensive. Getting a penetration test is an excellent test, but in my mind, less effective than a comprehensive security assessment. And a security assessment is actually far less involved from a financial aspect because um, assessing your configuration is not as near as time consuming. It doesn't require as much expertise as an actual penetration test where you actually have somebody do white hat hacking where they actually try to break in that that level of uh, penetration testing is quite expensive and helpful, but it, to me, it's something you do after you've had an assessment, after you've got things in place, and now you want to test how it's working, if that makes sense. Because, I mean, if you don't have these other things going, a penetration test, there's no doubt it's going to make it into your network, and there's you won't learn anything from it other than, yes, they can get into my network. It's better to do a full assessment, in my opinion, is the starting point. Gotcha. All right, here's one more. So regarding application control, is that similar to what Window Defender does uh, on Windows 10? Oh, great, great question. As you know, Windows Defender is, is really an interesting product as Microsoft has continued to develop it. Windows Defender built in is really just an antivirus program. In fact, it's not even considered one of the ones that include features like managed detection and response or EDR, unless you're doing the paid for version that's not the included with Windows 10 version. The Microsoft uh, protection stuff is quite good when configured and properly licensed. The stuff that comes right with the default operating system leaves a lot to be desired, for my opinion, mostly because it doesn't have a management component. Like as an IT guy, I can't know all of my customers that have that Defender application if they had an issue or not, or whether it's working or whether it's updating its definitions. And so, um, but application control is actually far more, if I had to choose between having antivirus or application control, I would actually choose application control because it would be more likely to stop the type of attacks that are going today. Um, but but Windows Defender or other antivirus programs essentially just try to look for bad things happening. But the reality of it is, is most attacks today are using normal IT methods rather than putting a virus in your uh, in your system. And so Windows Defender or other antivirus, even really good ones, that are even more expensive that don't just come with the operating system, those are still uh, going to be easily bypassed by a lot of the co current mechanisms. Application control is better at stopping those newer methods, if that makes sense. 
So they're right in the sense that they're both protection, but the application control is more comprehensive, in my opinion, and not the same as an antivirus product. Yeah, it, it, the I would just add to that that um, manageability because there is some forms of kind of application whitelisting built into some of the new uh, uh, Windows 365 stuff, but the manageability of it is um, a little, well, a lot better and different in in the approach that that application control uh, software has taken. Well, the, the reality of it is is um... I still think you need both. You still need a good antivirus and Windows Defender can be a good one if you're pairing it with some type of EDR utility on the endpoint protection side. And then I think application control rolls in on top of it. And it's similarly inexpensive in the grand scheme of things to license application control utilities. Uh, and so it, to me, you want both uh, is really a way to, to approach that. Excellent. All right, well, I think we're probably a little over time so uh, kick us over and we'll kind of conclude. Uh, just remember there's tons of kind of educational content on our website around assessments and application control. And in fact, I think you recently did a podcast that may be up there on application control, Carl, uh, but tons of great resources on the website. You know, we're always here to answer any kind of questions. Uh, hopefully everybody got uh, a lot of great value and, and learned some things um, during this. Carl, any, any parting comments? Yeah, hey, look, you know, uh, I, I guess like every long journey, it starts with one step and part of it is the education piece. We're happy to help with the education piece. We, we, we believe that the more people are educated, the more they're gonna make good decisions, the less they're gonna have problems with their IT. And that's really our mission is to make IT easy for people, right? Uh, I would, yeah, snaptechit.com slash resources. We have lots of things and lots of areas there that you can look into to learn about. And don't be afraid to reach out and just ask a specific question if you have one. Um, we're happy to answer them. Awesome. Well, thanks everybody for uh, attending today. Uh, like I said, we're recording this. We'll get this kind of kicked out to uh, for those of you that are on the call and uh, the ones that uh, that couldn't make it. And uh, I guess until next month, we'll see you soon. Take care, everybody. Thanks for coming.